with us today and in this second uh, workshop of the Digital Integrated Care Task Force that Ethel uh, organized. And we have uh, today the continuation of the first workshop we dedicated to the central theme of this year for uh, the task force that uh, are health data ecosystems. But first I would like to praise uh, uh, the, the different projects that are present in the call. Uh, we have access from 15 different countries, so this will enrich uh, the conversation because we are going to focus on health systems and uh, the development of uh, e-health, health data ecosystems, and ultimately governance and sustainability. But we have uh, experts from Digital Health Europe partners, from Interoperate, from M Health Hub, uh, Sidoc Exchange, and Vicar. Uh, I'm together with uh, Diane Whitehouse, uh, that she will uh, moderate with me. Uh, the discussion. Uh, so, Diane, anytime, feel free to uh, jump into the conversation. Uh, as I told you, the focus for uh, today's workshop is in this journey of developing digital tools to improve uh, different aspects of care, but particularly integrated uh, health and care. Uh, we, this year, we are focusing on the development of health data ecosystem and the value of mixing information data from uh, professional uh, gathered uh, collected data and personal collected data. Uh, but we have to uh, probably look back in time. And the idea today is that we will do a journey from uh, the very beginning of uh, e-health development to the current situation of uh, health data uh, ecosystems combining these third party data. Uh, in the last workshop, uh, we started uh, defining what, what is a health data ecosystem. We discussed about the challenges of how to develop a uh, health data ecosystem, and we use different examples from Israel. Uh, we have today Israel to uh, present in this journey, so it we will uh, expand our uh, knowledge on, on how these challenges have been overcome. And uh, finally, we found in, during the discussion that uh, it depends on the type of ecosystem, in fact, the type of health system, you are operating in, uh, and we compare open versus closed uh, health systems and uh, multiple versus single organizations uh, health care systems. And we focus particularly uh, in the discussion that uh, governance matters and uh, how this governance can uh, support under uh, sustainable uh, business model. This was in uh, back in June. Uh, today, we wanted to uh, develop further. That's why we are calling this deep diving into health data ecosystems for integrated care. And we wanted to focus particularly in governance and uh, sustainability. And to do this, uh, we have to look backwards, which were the governance uh, mechanisms, features that uh, ensure sustainability of these uh, developments over time and if they are valid for uh, the current situation. Uh, we run a live poll in the past uh, uh, workshop and we are going to do it uh, today too but just a brief summary of what came out of uh, uh, the survey that we run in the last session uh, we asked if uh, you consider that health data ecosystem is a blue ocean or a red ocean uh, taking uh, the concept or metaphor from the blue ocean strategy where there is uh, is completely a new market there is no uh, a strong competition and there's a lot of room of, for cooperation and developing new businesses. We ask about the core elements to develop health data ecosystems and collaboration and coordination between stakeholders stand out as the first uh, uh, the core element. Also, we explore the barriers, the obstacles, and uh, the, the participants, the experts, consider that organizational and cultural uh, obstacles were uh, the most uh, important to overcome uh, when we want to combine uh, professional generated data with uh, citizen generated data and finally we ask about the key mobilizers and public private partnerships and health and care 
professionals were the two key mobilizers on the for the development of health data ecosystems. This was in a nutshell uh, a summary of uh, some of the results that have been uh, you know, collated and, and reported in this fact sheet that we produced uh, recently and was uh, available in, uh, already in September. It's a fact sheet on health data ecosystems for integrated care, a new blue ocean. You can see the link uh, to the document. You can directly to, uh, download it. Uh, I think Diane has provided uh, through the chat box also the link for your convenience. So we encourage you to, to take a look. Uh, and actually, this is something that we plan to do out of this uh, workshop. So and, uh, here, I, I would like to remind this is not a webinar. It's not uh, unilateral uh, communication, but uh, multilateral. So we encourage the participation all over the, the workshop. So let's let's start introducing. Uh, in the preparation process of this uh, workshop, we had uh, some discussions with the presenters, and some element that uh, uh, came out was uh, the context we are working and the context we are living. And it's not only about COVID, but uh, about all the innovations, particularly in the digital field, that are emerging. And uh, this recalled a, a classical uh, management book uh, by Peter Vail called Managing as a Performing Art uh, that was published back in 1991. That could be considered out of date. But uh, the summary of uh, his message uh, is uh, describing this text, uh, I would like to read it. Uh, he says that most managers are taught to think of themselves as paddling their canoes on calm, still lakes where you can plan. Uh, they are led to believe that they should be pretty much able to go where they want, when they want, using means that are under their control. So the traditional strategic planning context. Sure, he says, there will be temporary disruptions during changes of various sorts, periods when they are they will have to shoot the rapids in their canoes, but the disruptions will be temporary. And when things settle back down, they'll be back in the calm, still lake mode. So a hope for more strategic planning. But in his uh, experience, he says, you never get out of the rapids. The feeling is one of continuous upset and chaos. And I think this is uh, applying absolutely to the current situation and particularly in the journey of developing uh, digital uh, tools for improving healthcare and to increase the integration between health and, and care. So we have this as uh, a new metaphor that we can add to the blue oceans. So they are not calm blue oceans. They can be uh, blue oceans full of uh, permanent white water if uh, we can use this metaphor. Uh, setting the scene for the conversation today. Uh, we are adopting a health system perspective and particularly a database health system perspective. And uh, this is uh, understood under the frame of, uh, let's say, close uh, health system where different initiatives over the last two decades have uh, appeared, developed, and particularly they have focused on developing the health information exchange between professionals. So the data that was exchanged and the information that was exchanged was uh, for professional use, their interoperability aspects and the development of different uh, EHR strategy at national or regional level were uh, the, the main landmarks. Uh, and uh, we uh, understand that in this process of development, there are some differences that are significant uh, between uh, health systems that decide to define these developments from top uh, comparing with those that are a bit more open and are, uh, encourage innovation to come from the grassroots, so a bottom-up approach. And we wanted to compare these two approaches because we think that it applies perfectly to the development of health data ecosystems. And of course, there are many enablers. We will be focusing on governance today, but uh, the legal framework, the infrastructure development, and particularly the incentive, the economic incentives that are uh, sent to the different actors in the health sector are critical for uh, these developments. Uh, but we want to add uh, the permanent white water here. And in the sense of health data ecosystems, this comes from two main sources. First, we have people that are increasingly uh, engaged in uh, their care. And uh, through these digital tools, 
they are able to exchange data with uh, uh, the health system. So, in, and this is by the bidirectional. They can access the information through uh, patient portals or uh, personal health records, but they can also report about their uh, health or wealth status. And this information can be of use and work, and work for uh, professionals to improve care and particularly to coordinate care and, and, and do it in a more person-centered uh, way. And in parallel with this, we have the, the emergence of uh, plenty of medical devices, health apps, mobile health apps that are able to provide additional data into this health data ecosystem. The question is the governance that work uh, in the first stage of development of professional generated data will work or won't work to uh, absorb these uh, sources of data that can come from uh, people, from patients or from uh, medical devices and health apps. This is the scene for today. And we wanted to confront these two approaches, the top-down approach, the bottom-up approach. And that's why we invited uh, two countries that I will present right now to uh, make a face of, uh, of their strategies and approaches. The goals for this workshop, clearly they are uh, to learn how health IT and health data ecosystems in particular, in particular, they are shaped at country level, uh, again, insisting on the health system country level perspective, explore governance principles and functions that drive implementation of digital health and the development of health data ecosystems. And finally, to review national strategies to make them sustainable and open to innovation to increase health and care integration. Having uh, done this introduction, uh, this is the agenda for today. We plan to have two uh, presentations. The first one will be in charge uh, of Nessa Barry from the Scottish Government on digital health and care in Scotland. And the second one will be provided by Rachel Kay from Asuta Medical Centers on the Israeli health data ecosystem. Uh, we assume that the Scottish uh, health system is more a top-down approach and the Israeli health system is more a bottom-up uh, uh, approach. So we want to learn from the different uh, experiences and then afterwards we will have the discussion that we will be driven by a live poll that will orchestrate uh, uh, the discussion. So uh, I think it's time to start and I would like to invite and thanks uh, Nessa from uh, the Scottish government, actually her uh, title is Knowledge Exchange Manager in the Technology Enabled Care and Digital Healthcare Innovation. So I will hand over to you, Nessa, for uh, the presentation and I can pass the slides for you and uh, we start with the first set of uh, presentation. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon about the Scottish health data ecosystem. Um, we're taking a fairly wide interpretation of what a health data ecosystem means, um, but hopefully it will be useful information and stimulate the conversation as part of the session. I thought it would be best to start with a little bit of context setting in terms of the Scottish system. And some of the points are directly relevant then, I believe, to why the Scottish system has emerged and developed the way it has. So a couple of demographic or basic information points. The Scottish population at the last count was 5.4 million citizens and the health budget in Scotland for the year 2018-2019 was 13.4 billion. In Scotland we have 14 regional or geographic health board areas, so 14 regional health boards. We also have seven special health boards. What is a special health board? Essentially that means they provide services for all the regional boards and that service might be in terms of logistics, um, supplies, it may be in terms of information analytics, data analysis, or it may be in terms of improvement methodologies and support and resources around that kind of activity. We also have one public health body in Scotland just freshly reminted this year in April 2020, a perfect time to have a new public health body launch, I think you will agree. And we have over 900 general practices. I just wanted to give you a bit of a, a, an insight into how the services are constructed. Of course, in Scotland, in the UK, in Scotland, general practices, general practitioners are considered to be independent contractors. 
and they contract their services to their health board area. We also have 32 local authorities in Scotland, local authorities otherwise known as council areas or perhaps municipalities. And an important point for this conversation to note, the Scottish Parliament was actually established in 1999, <clears throat> not that long ago in the great scheme of things. And even more importantly for our conversation, health is an area of devolved responsibility in Scotland. Why is that so important? I think it really goes directly to um, how health ICTs have evolved in the period subsequently. It certainly meant that we've had less proliferation or fragmentation of health ICT systems in Scotland than other parts of the UK. And of course, it's also meant that there was a stimulus or a need to have Scottish policy, Scottish strategy around digital health care ICTs. And that's a, been a growing area for us. And also another key feature for us in Scotland is we talk about digital health and care all the time now. Um, in other areas, I know we still talk about digital health only or digital tools in healthcare or health ICT. And why is that important for us? Well, since 2014 and the Public Bodies Joint Working Act, as it's formally called, uh, which actually really came into power in 2015, we have legislation in Scotland around adult health and social care integration. A long-winded way of saying we absolutely have to and want to consider health and social care together in terms of our planning and in terms of our delivery. So that's a very new feature of the system in Scotland. And it obviously affects how we consider things like digital health and the data ecosystem. The healthcare system in Scotland, the NHS, is um, considered to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, employers in Scotland, although our social care colleagues would certainly say they're catching up there. And also it's worth noting that there's a very strong sense of citizen ownership of health and care services in Scotland. Um, and I don't personally, and from my colleagues and the work I do, I don't think that's just a nice statement to make. I think it's a, a genuine sense that people have of ownership of their system. So for us in Scotland, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport has responsibility over all of these areas and I'm sure some others. Um, but I just wanted to flag up a couple of the public health priorities as you see on the right side of the slide. So again, this goes back to that sense of what is, what is digital health and care and where does it fit in the grand scheme? Um, it's about how we deliver services, how we access services, how we provide access to services, how we use data better to understand our services and what our citizens need and want. But it's also about supporting people to have healthy lives in healthy communities to do better than we're doing currently in terms of mental health and ill health, um, to do better in terms than we're doing currently in terms of poverty and inequality. And it's maybe a grand leap for some, but I definitely think digital health and care and the data ecosystem can play a role in supporting those initiatives. So the purpose of the conversation today is really about that data ecosystem and what characterizes the Scottish system as different in some ways from the Israeli system or any other system. I think it's fair to say that Scotland can be seen as an example of a top-down ecosystem. And why do I say that? Well, really, a couple of obvious points. We've had very strong, consistent Scottish government policy and strategy around the role of technology in health and care more laterally. And we've had very consistent um, approaches in terms of those policies and strategies really since the mid-2000s about where data and digital health fits in terms of our ambitions. We don't always achieve all our ambitions, that's for sure. I don't think we're on our own in that case. But regardless of which policy or which political party rather has been in government, there has been consistent support and it has been top down support. I mentioned earlier, there's a far narrower range of systems available to a healthcare practitioner in Scotland to use in terms of digital tools than there might be in other parts of the UK and certainly other parts of the world. And that level of government support um, and intervention is seen as, yes, a controlling factor, but also very much about providing um, support, governance and um, kind of assurance around the system. And digital health and data broadly digital health and care are being embedded into policy recommendations and actions, which again is a consequence of the place it sits within Scottish government, the way it's seen, how it's viewed. And we see a lot of commitment in terms of um, activities, initiatives, but also targeted funding for particular policy areas where 
um, it's believed that the digital tools can support our policy initiatives. And I would just flag up again, integration is a big one for us, improving access to services generally, mental health being one area, um, and supporting people to remain supported at home and in their own communities. How does that leverage integration and how does data and digital tools leverage integration? We have some examples in Scotland, but I still think we have certainly got a long way to go. Um, we have examples where some of the colleagues I work with are supporting health and social care partnerships to use data better around the management, for example, of people who are frail or vulnerable or people who are more likely to fall or need extra support at home. And we have examples around cardiology support. We have examples around the long-term management of conditions in the home, um, chronic conditions, cardiac disease, etc. Um, so we see examples emerging of how the tools can be used to support a more integrated approach. But as I say, we have a way to go. And this is just a brief timeline of some of the key developments that we have seen really since um, 2001. I simply chose 2001 because I was using 1999 as a kind of uh, key mark in the sand, if you like, for the Scottish Parliament. So we have the emergence from 2001 of NHS 24, which is nationally accessible, out of our service uh, for health information and advice. Started as a telephony-based service and has very quickly moved to being a web-based as well as telephony service. NHS 24, just as a point of interest, receives over a million and a half calls a year um, and provides a massive range of support now, both online and by telephone, not just um, kind of your typical out of hours, the GP practice is closed, who will I call? They provide a huge range of services. From the mid 2000s onwards, we had the key policy documents I've also referenced, but also um, the growth of the Scottish Care Information System to exchange data between primary and secondary care, and then the rollout of the Emergency Care Summary nationally from 2006 onwards. The Emergency Care Summary is held by the GPs, it's updated daily. Um, it's essentially a core short record of information including um, key allergies, medications and diagnoses that can be accessed particularly in the out of hours period uh, by paramedics, by NHS 24, by A&E practi practitioners. Um, and then we've had growth in areas around supporting technology moving into the community, into people's homes. We already through social care and the councils had a reasonable uptake of the basic telecare packages in Scotland, but that's really seen a big push in recent years. And obviously this year has um, changed things again for us. And the emergency care summary and, and palliative care summary and key information care summaries have developed since. I think what you probably noticed from this slide, hopefully, is that in Scotland we've taken a very iterative approach. In other words, we take our time. <laughs> we don't go fast with any of these developments. Um, they tend to be discussed and consulted upon and implemented really in a step-by-step -step process. And just bringing us up to date, and I'll mention a little bit more about this, the National Digital Service is really where we're trying to bring the pieces of the picture together to create a national, connected, accessible at the point of care record. Yes, of course, we have lots of hospital information systems still, and yes, of course, we have dedicated records for certain health conditions, but a system that is nationally accessible at the point of care, um, both as a store and as an open um, EHR architecture system to develop new applications is what we're working on for now. Next slide, please. Okay, um, just some of the features that sit around governance, I would say, and um, that the developments are always aligned with strategy. Um, there's always room for research and development. I don't want to give the impression that you know there, there's no innovation unless the government is involved. That's not the case at all. Um, but it is, it is overwhelmingly about aligning the work with what the clinical and government policy priorities are. That there is a responsible actor, in this case the Scottish Government, and you know where to find support, you know who's responsible. Um, that the quality strategy for us guides the principles of how we, we act, the quality strategy essentially that all the delivery of all health and care services, including the way we deploy digital health, should be safe, effective and person-centred, that we use quality improvement methodology, and I think Raquel will probably speak more to that, and that we develop leadership and partnership. And this has been even more so important than in the last four to five years as the um, Integration Act became reality. It had always been important to have good, strong relationships with colleagues in social care and housing and, and beyond health. 
but really it's been a very strong feature for us in the last four, five, six years, I would say. And it's helped us actually to scale up a lot of the services we're looking at. Um, the leadership uh, across the public sector so that services are not seen to be or um, believed to be only about the healthcare system, um, that they're about the citizen first and then the system supports around that. And that it's a driver for that integration and participation by the citizen. The next slide, please. Um, just a very brief slide to show you the, the key domains of the Scottish Digital Health and Care Strategy. Um, the strategy is actually going to be refreshed in the next six months, but many of these work areas, as you will see, they're, they're fairly straightforward in terms of understanding. They will continue, um, but we, it's time for a refresh. This one is two years old now. Uh, next slide, please. And I mentioned the National Digital Service, that this is the digital platform really upon which we want to hang other services, if that makes sense. Um, the first application that's been developed um, within the team and in very close collaboration with clinician engagement and service user engagement is what's called the RESPECT process. That's actually um, a service that's been paper-based up until now and it provides um, emergency care response essentially for somebody um, who's in the stage of you know, chronic serious long-term condition or who's in receiving palliative care. Um, so it was a paper-based service um, used in a couple of the health board areas um, and the team behind that have been developing that into essentially the platform application that can be used. Again, it's going to be that iterative approach that build, build, test, build, um, develop with the users, with the staff. Um, the core for the service really will be around how, how we kind of garner support and keep on building. Um, so the next slide was just to say that that slide that flashed quickly by. Of course, there's a wider ecosystem um, to all of this. And for us, um, it won't be unfamiliar, I don't think, to anybody. The logos may be different, but it's about government, it's about policy. Yes, of course, but it's about the services, it's about our R&D, our higher education institutions, it's about our citizens and our SMEs. And the final slide, I think, or final two. Um, this one brings us right up to date. This is a, just a quick slide from the Scottish Government's brand new, as of about 10 days ago, programme for government for 2020-21. And again, this is just to emphasise why, why are we able to develop digital health and care services that become sustained routine services, not just projects. Um, it's about anchoring it into policy and anchoring it clearly into key objectives for policy. So we have the scale up of video consultation, the scale up of um, internet based based or computerised um, cognitive behavioural therapy services nationally. And the final slide. And just a quick reflection back then about key messages in terms of today's session and perhaps for the conversation. Really important factors for us in Scotland and things that we're learning all over again this year about ma maintaining momentum um, and supporting the ecosystem, that all the users have to be involved, even if that's messy or difficult at times, that your senior stakeholders across the sector are so important and you cannot underestimate the time that's required to build those relationships and maintain them. And that's a positive. Um, so some people may take that as a negative. And also something that takes time and effort but is absolutely worth it if you want sustainable services is understanding what the citizens want and need and believe they need. Um, and digitally enabled workforce goes right back to that leadership. You can't have it without a digitally enabled workforce to underpin everything you want to do. Um, and we benefit massively in Scotland. A lot of the services that we have scaled up, and I'm thinking particularly around chronic disease management, long-term conditions, remote health monitoring, mental health, all of these services that we have scaled up in digital health have um, started in a European or international collaboration, and that's been really important for us to test and improve what we're doing. And that we have a governance structure that is supportive and not restrictive. It can feel restrictive at times, I think, for individual healthcare practitioners, but it is supportive. And I would say, just finally, you know, we talk about top down and bottom up. Um, it is a top down system in Scotland, but I think certainly we could say that in some ways it's leaning towards a bottom up system, if that's not too cheeky. Um, and bottom up in the sense of really, really trying to listen better um, to what our citizens and our staff want and develop services in line with that. Thank you, Tino. Thank you very much, Nessa. Uh, it has been really a comprehensive uh, journey of what we have done in the last 20 years. And 
nice to see the top down is uh, changing uh, to a bottom up and, and to illustrate this uh, bottom up approach uh, we have uh, Rachel uh, Kay, International Projects Coordinator from Asuta Medical Centers and she will uh, present uh, the Israeli uh, health data ecosystem. So essentially, um, I will, uh, you, you will see, you get a very complete, very different picture when you talk about Israel. And I wanted to just first start with this slide, which is actually about two years old. So the numbers have changed a little bit, but essentially Israel's health data ecosystem is very dynamic. And there's, in addition to the uh, government and the HMOs, there are a lot of industry um, uh, initiatives that are going into it and incubators you can sort of see. So it's a very, very dynamic uh, ecosystem today. Um, the context, to, so to kind of go back so you can get a, a picture of the system, the Israeli context for the health data ecosystem is unlike Scotland, it is a Bismarckian system, which is um, by definition um, decentralized. Uh, so you see the picture of, of the Ministry of Health, and then you have the health funds or the HMOs uh, on one side, and there are four and they're nationwide HMOs which compete with each other uh, for membership among the, popu the population, which in Israel today is a little bit above 9 million. Um, and then you have the hospitals on the other side. Um, and actually the HMOs are both uh, differently from Europe, they're both insurers and providers. They're not just sick funds who provide uh, reimbursement. They actually are responsible for delivery of service, um, either by themselves or through contracting. Um, they're accountable for the health of their members as well as their healthcare expenditures. And one of the things that really is a defining feature of the Israeli healthcare system is the relative autonomy of the Israeli HMOs um, that uh, continue to, and, and the strong competition among them. So the characteristics of the Israeli health data ecosystem is, as I said, four competing nationwide HMOs, and they're competing, among other things, on digital excellence. Um, they, there was, basically, there was an implementation of comprehensive shared organization-wide electronic medical records in all HMOs by the mid-1990s. Um, and that was followed by computer, computerization and integration of all clinical and management systems, patient portals, telehealth, virtual care. The entire health data ecosystem at the HMO level was really by the early 2000s was already in place. Um, and the initiatives at the HMO and hospital level continue to be the main drivers for innovation for digital health rather than the national government, although there's been a change uh, there. This is just an example. I took Maccabi, who was the first HMO to basically implement electronic medical records uh, nation, uh, organization wide, and you can see all of the stuff that, um, that exists in that uh, ecosystem which supports integrated care. However, um, I think there's been a change over the last decade in terms of the overall context. And the Ministry of Health over the last decade has assumed increasing leadership at the national level and done two things to sort of pull it together to a national, to be a more national system rather than a bunch of localized systems. And that is the development and implementation of a national EHR exchange, which enables exchange of data uh, between uh, all of the HMOs and the hospitals and an articulation of a national strategy for digital health. Uh, but you can see if you look at the structure of the architecture of the national system, you can see that it reflects the local autonomy of the HMOs and hospital data systems and, uh, and respects that. Um, what I'm gonna try and do is kind of, I'm gonna focus on governing principles, but what I wanna do is go through three stages, initiation, uh, sort of like the early days of, of getting things up and going, then ongoing management, and then building the future. Because even though some of you will see that there's some kind of continuity among the governance systems, but they're different. They're different at each stage, and they, um, and they, and they appear differently, and it's probably uh, worthwhile looking at that. So if we look at the example of Maccabi, which, as I said, was the first one to implement EMRs, what did we see in terms of the critical success factors? that a visionary CEO who 
was able to do both strategy and hands-on uh, and was involved actually at, at a very detailed level. We had health IT steering committees that were organization-wide. We also have independent practitioners like Scotland. In fact, not only the GPs, but all of our physicians, including our specialists, are independent doctors. And so we made a joint decision with them to, to, to put in place an EMR. Uh, we could not have done it without their agreement. Um, and then there was basically, we created a cross-sector implementation management scheme. The EMR was developed in such a way that it supported the clinician's workflow and reduced bureaucracy, um, and also guaranteed them payment for visits. Um, the doctors designed the EMR user interface according to what they wanted, not according to what the organization wanted. The first implementers volunteered. Um, and the organization provided financial incentives. The EMR doctors got more money um, until we got to a critical mass, at which point the EMR became mandatory. And of course, we have dedicated mandatory workshops and one-on-one -on -one for all of the people who use the system. So if you look at how that reflects in terms of governance principles, which can apply on an organization-wide basis, and I think with a little bit of tweaking could probably apply on a regional basis and maybe even a national basis as well. Innovative leadership, vision, proactive involvement, commitment, including commitment of resources, very crucial as a, as a governance principle. Active involvement of all the state, key, key stakeholders, starting with the clinicians. And I, I want to emphasize, you know, Netta talked about a lot about citizens and we basically, our perception was that we had to start with the clinicians. If we didn't get the clinicians on board, we didn't have a system. Um, assessment of context needs and challenges. And I think one thing that was really important in terms of stakeholder commitment was the clear identification of concrete and compelling needs and immediate benefits. If you're gonna put in all this effort, you need to be able to show that. Um, another thing that was really important was incentives, both all, at all three levels. And of course, as I mentioned before, integrated responsibility, um, strongly collaborative, but with clear objectives and guidelines and training and support. And you'll see that by the way, in all of the stages. So now I'll go to stage two, which is ongoing management. And basically leadership, leadership, leadership is important always at all stages. Uh, it changes, however. Uh, the difference between a, a visionary leader that's really pushing strongly for something to get off the ground is a little bit different than ongoing management, where you still need solid supportive leadership uh, that encourages and motivates innovation. You need to have a, per a permanent budget. One of the things that moves you from the project level to the real life level is having a permanent budget. Uh, you need to foster continued strategic planning. Um, and have, of course, then increasingly broadened collaboration of all stakeholders, including citizens. Um, there needs to be a clear process and organizational structure for setting priorities, evaluating new technologies, allocating budgets. And basically two things that we saw um, in our HMOs, and I think also in the hospitals as well, was that we developed multidisciplinary steering committees uh, that really brought all of the key people in the organization together. And we said we had new organizational units with new skills, such as medical informatics and, and quality assurance that never existed before, uh, but there was a necessity for them. Um, another thing that I think became increasingly obvious and important was building strong relationships between management clinicians and IT. Um, they really had to become very, very cohesive in terms of how they work together. Ongoing feedback and assessment by all the system users, including members, patients, doctors, health professionals, managers, et cetera, was really crucial, crucial in terms of the ongoing management, uh, which enabled us to monitor and evaluate both successes and failures um, and have a continuous learning environment. Competition remained important. In other words, one of the triggers, even on the ongoing stage that kept pushing everybody forward was the competition between HMOs as well as the competition between hospitals. Um, and then the system, of course, achieved a critical mass. So if you, just two examples, so I'm not talking in the abstract, this is, 
this is this is sort of similar to Nessa's slide. This shows you the evolution of the health data ecosystem in Maccabi, beginning with the EHR all the way up through um, e-consultation, mobile, more, and the more there's a lot more now, particularly in the telehealth area, uh, based upon uh, our experience with COVID. Uh, another example is Clalit Health Services, which is the largest of the HMOs. It's larger than Maccabi. As you saw, Maccabi is 25% and Khalid is 45% of the population. They did something in 1999. They basically created the first prototype of a, of a national EHR. They together with, uh, they were developing a regional health information organization and they partnered with a company called DB Motion that developed a web-based electronic health record with no central database base, no requirement to replace existing information systems and no disruption to work, workflow. And Khalid initially implemented this in its clinics and hospitals and very quickly it began to spread uh, to other uh, governments, to the government hospitals and other public hospitals. And today the OFIC network is basically the, the foundation of Israel's national EHR exchange, which connects all HMOs with all hospitals. But it started as an initiative at, at the HMO level. Um, now we get to the assuring sustainability. So let me go back. Um, what kind of the governance principles that are really important for assuring sustainability? One is to have a climate that fosters innovation, change, seeing the future, and welcomes disruption. And this is really tough, even at an organizational level, let alone at a regional and national level, but it's really crucial. Another thing is embedding IT and ongoing organizational processes. It becomes a way of life. Nobody in Israel can conceive of how they, how they can operate in any other way. And I'm talking about citizens as well uh, as healthcare professionals and managers. Uh, competition and incentives remains critical. You need to, there has to be something that keeps everybody going um, and a competition is a, is, is a real motivator. Uh, collaboration and co-design is really important and become, we keep up to, everybody keeps updating what they're doing uh, based upon feedback from the users because always, with, you, you always you want to make it easier for your users to use in order for them to use it. Flexibility and adaptability, addressing unforeseen needs. We have all been here. The challenge of the last six to seven months has been over, has really tested our flexibility and adaptability. And, uh, and, and in order to, to meet the, 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 the unique needs that nobody could have anticipated a year ago. Uh, another thing that's really important that we found really important in the Israeli environment is learning to partner with the tech industry. Um, and and, and, and I think we've done that rather well. Um, securing commitment and leadership at the top levels of governance is really crucial. And, and here we talk for between top down and bottom up at a certain point in time, regardless of where you start. And I think Nessa noted this as well. You have to find the appropriate balance and dynamic between top down and bottom up. And of course, ongoing training and support to all users has to happen always. Um, and this just to give you an example, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but you see the evolution, for example, of the Maccabi patient portal. Um, it started off as a website that you could only access from your computer, and it's now available, and most people access it by mobile. It started off by providing the citizen with access to information. Now it's, there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a platform for dynamic interaction between patients um, and providers. Um, and basically, citizens uh, move be from being passive recipients to proactive partners, um, and they can initiate virtual visits, they can do messaging, they can do chatting, and of course, now we even have a big data AI-based symptom checker, which the patient initiates, and then he can move to talk to his, his uh, clinician if he so desires. Another example is the IT evolution in the Suta Medical Centers where I'm working uh, today. And essentially, it's a hospital. So we look at the hospital rather than an HMO. Uh, it's a hospital network 
with uh, basically seven hospitals and clinics across the country. It has a network-wide EMR. It has a patient portal, which is mainly used for um, providing outpa information with regard to outpatient uh, results. The, uh, there's a link between the HMO and the EMR. So for example, if I do a test in Asuta, uh, it will show up in my uh, HMO portal as well as going directly to my doctor. Um, Asuta has a mobile EMR for its doctors, which enabled the doctors to access their uh, electronic medical record from wherever they may be. And there's a proactive link with patients uh, by SMS in all kinds of situations. If you, for example, make an appointment for a test, you immediately get a confirmation by SMS plus a link, which explains to you exactly what the test is about and exactly how you have to prepare for it. Um, which is, is really very, very important. And now we're doing PROMS, so we're getting patient reported outcomes. And I think that the big, big push that happened as a result of, of COVID was teleconsultation, which uh, we did in a whole variety of specialties in order to enable patients to continue to get their care without coming uh, physically to the hospital. So, if you look at all of this and we look at the sustainability, which is basically looking toward the future, I think there are a couple of things that kind of stand out for me at least. One is we have to change the semantic. You know, there's a lots of words that we use and lots of terms that we use, and I think we need to rethink them. We talk about clinician engagement, patient engagement, user engagement. We're not getting engaged anymore, folks. We're getting married. And it, you have to change your perception the nature of the relationship among all of the actors and the stakeholders in this system is very intimate and very close, and it's not something that uh, anybody can walk away from. The other thing is that we talk about empowerment, but it's not really empowerment. We're not, we're not empowering anybody to do anything by themselves, but we are building partnerships and partnerships between clinicians and patients and managers and all of the, and, and, and partnerships, of course, with, with industry and other stakeholders. So all of these things are really, uh, I think we need to start thinking about them a little bit differently if we want sustainable, growing, dynamic systems. And the other thing, I think, I think this is my final slide, is if you look toward the future, we never refreeze. We don't have the luxury. You know, you, Lewin's three stages of change and change management are uh, unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. And my perception is that we can never refreeze. We don't have that luxury. If you look at the healthcare needs of the population, the rapid pace of technology change, and the advances in medical care, it demands a process of ongoing transformation and openness. We can never sit on our laurels. So if we look toward the future, we need to, in order for them to, be, to, be ha to have sustainable health data ecosystems, we need to assure an ongoing process of bridging the gaps between where we are and where we want to be and learning from our mistakes and correcting on an ongoing basis and creating new challenges and new goals all the time. I mean, Corona hit us with a bunch of challenges that we didn't expect, but even without Corona, we need to be creating new challenges and new goals. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and, and particularly to explain all uh, this in such a short time is, is really challenging. Uh, I think the chat box is burning, Diane, and there's many questions that uh, uh, we should uh, address uh, before the live poll? Uh, what do you think? Hey, Tina. Um, well, let me concentrate on one broad question that's coming up several times. Uh, and then in the discussion session, we can go further on, on more details. Um, there are a number uh, of people who were interested in how the ecosystems themselves have been built up, how they're managed, how they're fostered, and also what are the chief incentives for the various stakeholders? And in a way, I'm merging some questions that have been posed by Megan, by Mark, um, and a couple of other people. So really more about the 
process uh, than about the empirical facts and certainly a question about what the incentives have been. Uh, and that's open to both Nessa and to Rahel. Nessa, do you want to start or should I start? Uh, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. <laughs> I, was talking All right. to I, I mean, I think actually my slide pretty much answered that those questions. Um, essentially, I think that when you, the reason that, the reason that we started building the health data ecosystem is because we realized that in order to manage a modern healthcare system, as complex as it is with as much information as available, there was no other way to go. It was just, it had to be done. And we, it, you know, everybody came around, I think, to that perception, but in, in, in Israel, we perceived it very, very early. And that's, it was, we had, partially because we had some innovative leadership who really were able to perceive what was coming down the road. But I think that basically the thing, the driver was that we recognized that we couldn't manage our system um, and provide good medical care and good health care to people if we did not build a health data ecosystem. And then I think I described the stages about how we did it. We began to partner with the key stakeholders and we built it step by step and we provided incentives. I mean, you know, we paid our doctors. And you know this is not being done so much today, but we paid our doctors an extra, I don't remember, 2% for each patient um, that they were caring for who was, was on their, their ticket um, if, if they computerized, if they went to electronic medical records. And we did all kinds of other uh, kinds of things to, to give them incentives and support. Um, and then, you know, you get to a certain point when you build enough of the infrastructure and you get everybody working on it and you achieve critical mass that it sort of begins to push itself in a way. Because as people perceive what they can do that they couldn't do before, they want more. And there you have to have strong management to be able to set priorities and say, okay, we can't do everything at once. What do we need to do first, second, third, and fourth? Um, but I think that that really I I presented this process pretty I was very process oriented. Uh, and yeah, Rahel, I, I, just I, to just to clarify, is that um, is that your particular health uh, provider, or was that Israel as a whole? So. As I say, if you look at the HMOs, the HMOs are very competitive. So as soon as one did one thing, everybody did it. Everybody followed suit in one fashion or another, and that still goes on. So that one, the HMOs cover the entire population. So once the HMOs were out there doing all this stuff and competing with each other, and everybody was transparent, everybody knew what everybody else was developing, and and it was just a question of who got there first in any in any case that really kept the ball rolling and now of course um, the ministry of health has gotten very much more uh, on board with us and exercising more leadership and so essentially we are all now working together in a much more i think cohesive fashion uh, than we were before so basically because I, I was talking about a bottom-up grassroots thing. It started at the organizational level and the organizationals, the, the individual organizations, the HMOs and the hospitals continue to operate in a semi, a, a, a fairly autonomous way in terms of improvising. Nobody's telling them what to do. Um, uh, unless there's sometimes there's a need, there's, there are some things where the government will say, hey, we need this. So when they put in quality measures, they came to everybody and they said, okay, we're putting in quality measures and you've got to report your information so we can compare you all in terms of the quality of services you're providing. But by and large, by and large, there's, there's still that dynamic that's, that's moving uh, at the organizational level and moving up. And Nessa, uh, and I know you have colleagues here, Margaret and Donna and others from Scotland. How do you how do you see that ecosystem building from from your side? Um, 
top down, bottom up or a hybrid? Yeah, I would agree with a lot of what Rachel has just said. Um, I would just add a, a couple of points for us. I think we came to it later or we're coming to it later. You know, that point, Rachel, where you said that, you know, we just can't keep doing it like this. Um, we certainly were not as early adopter as you have been. Absolutely not, especially in EHR. Um, but, you know, we're getting there. But the other thing I would say that's been a uh, difference is, uh, Mark pointed this out in the chat, we've had successive initiatives from Scottish Government where where the digital or the you know digital health aspect is used as leverage wrapped up in something else. Um, so how does it help you meet your local objectives as a healthcare provider? How does it help you meet the targets that you're required to meet by the Scottish Government? How does it help you achieve on um, workforce development or recruitment or patient safety initiatives or other things that you have to do anyway? Um, those are, are maybe a bit more prosaic, but they're, I think, really important in bringing people to the table. But then once you've got them there, if you get them there, it's a demonstration of benefit, as Rachel said. You know, why is it better? Why does it make your service better? Um, and I agree that the, the, the way we speak and has changed the way we speak about citizens and, you know, we're all in this together. And I genuinely believe that. But I also equally believe, maybe it's two contrasting things to believe together, but I equally believe you have to be able to make it make sense to the service managers and the service providers before you're going to get any additional benefit from it. Um, and the other thing I think probably to just flag up is public expectations. I'm sure they vary in different parts of Europe depending on the kind of healthcare system that you have and what people expect from it, how, how people expect it to operate or what they expect to get back directly or how accessible they expect it to be. Um, and that's definitely shifting for us as well in Scotland. Um, you know, in the past, it, it was very much a, it shall be done upon you and you shall stand and wait and you shall receive it. When we decide, you shall receive it. Um, but that's changing. That's changing, as is our openness to collaboration with a much wider group of partners. Right, right, right. Very international at the moment. I I know that. Um, I I. At this point, I'd like to ask Tino, because we have a front row of people with, with a variety of backgrounds from a lot of places. I'll hand over to you and we'll come back, Tino. Thank you, Diane. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, a front row of five uh, ladies, Megan Bradway, uh, researchers at the Norwegian Center for eHealth Research, Jacqueline Savoroska, that is the eHealth Directorate Advisor at the Ministry of Health, of the Republic of North Macedonia, Donna Henderson, that is also uh, a founding member of the Digital Integrated Care Task Force uh, and Head of International Engagement at the uh, Tech and Digital Health Innovation Scottish Government, uh, a, a colleague uh, uh, from ASUTA, Reut Ron, uh, Health Policy Researcher, and also uh, Margaret uh, Wariske, Director of Technology in Agri Care. Scottish Government. So thank you very much uh, for joining uh, the discussion. What I propose to you now is uh, to do the live poll with all of you and uh, we will address the questions and the comments on the results of these questions uh, with this uh, excellent front row of uh, experts. So I, I would like to ask you all uh, to go to this website menti.com. You can do it with your uh, computer but you can also access through uh, your mobile phone and once you land uh, to this website it will ask you for a code that is the one that is on top of the screen right now uh, 2745294 and the first question is just a simple question please name your country your region this uh, is not a nominal uh, survey it's just to to have the full picture of countries represented in in the call. Once we have this, the first question, in fact, will be the following one. I'm opening already uh, for uh, your votes. Uh, in this contrast of top-down versus bottom-up, what? How would you? Great, your health system is more a top-down approach like Scotland or is more a bottom-up approach like Israel or some somewhere in between the link look is menti.com 
and when you reach there you can uh, access with the code that is on top of the screen right now so it looks like uh, uh, somewhere in between is, is uh, the general question. This is just a, as a, an opener. Uh, the, the critical point will be, or the critical question will be the following. <clears throat> so let's leave this like this, and I will uh, give you access now to the first question. And this is the one that we would like to have the opinion of the front row. Uh, we ask you to use only one word. And, uh, in your opinion, what is the main obstacle to helping health systems absorb more digital health innovation? And particularly those that were uh, pointed at the beginning as the frontiers of health data ecosystems uh, that come from patient-generated data or uh, digital uh, health, uh, medical devices, health, M health apps. And I, I would like, once we have uh, enough uh, answers, to uh, ask Megan if if you can give us your view on on obstacles. Uh, I know that you are working on research of uh, M Health, and uh, we would like to know what is your uh, opinion on on the obstacles. We can see rigidity and budget as the key two elements. Culture is gaining uh, weight. From from our, uh, we do a lot of co-design workshops and a lot of uh, research about um, how specifically patient-gathered data can be entered into or integrated into a, a, a clinical consultation or a clinical workload. And uh, training is no longer seen in oh it's tiny um but it but it seems like uh healthcare providers need more specific training about how to relate to this different kind of data because they're used to making decisions based upon uh uh you know blood tests clinical measurements um they don't know how to relate to all of these different types of data that patients are gathering when when we're talking about um mobile health apps uh, self-management and we work with uh, self-management for diabetes as our use case um, so training on how to do that but also I agree with um, uh, anybody who is saying structure uh, so the way that the the data is structured and presented during the consultations really affects the the practical way that you can use it because again we're looking at you know between 15 minutes to you know, a, a short amount of time that this these consultation discussions are happening. So, in terms of practicality, that's that's what we've seen. This is uh, a question that requires a bit uh, thinking. Uh, the question is how important for person-centered care is to increase the flow of data generated by patients. And uh, we have this scale from not important to very important, but classify on four uh, areas of uh, uh, based on, on the mor morbidity uh, or uh, the health promotion and disease uh, prevention. Also for infection disease, we have many experience of incorporating data from patients in, in the current pandemic uh, for non-communicable diseases. Uh, that was the previous uh, plan. And for capturing patient experience measures, And I will, once we have enough uh, uh, answers, I would like to ask uh, the question to uh, Margaret and Donna uh, from uh, the Scottish Health System perspective. Uh, this, this was featured by uh, NESA uh, in, the, in this process, was not to emphasize the elements of integrating, uh, integrating data from patients, so which are your views? And according to the results, that there is a clear uh, 
element on capturing particularly patient experience measures. And if we are moving towards value-based healthcare and we have to incorporate the patient experience, we need uh, to get this data. This is not necessarily entering into the clinical workflow, but uh, for health promotion and disease prevention, particularly at primary care level, this is uh, really important. So, uh, Margaret uh, and Donna, would you like to uh, comment on, on the results of the question? Thanks, yes. So, absolutely, I think um, we need to have much more focus on citizen-generated um, data and how that flows. I think that's, that's the issue. And so clearly for capturing patient experience, we're not going to be able to capture that unless we have direct um, data um, flowing in. Um, I mean, I rated all of them pretty highly um, because I think we need to incorporate, you know, the, the person-centered approach around the flow of data um, across our, our, our sort of whole health and care system. Um, I think we've got elements of that in Scotland. Uh, we've got lots of ambitions to have much more um, citizen-centric um, data and uh, information. Uh, and, you know, I think we will be focusing on that increasingly. Interestingly, for it may be included under, I suppose, disease prevention, but I guess, I guess some of the work we've been doing in Scotland around scaling up some of the self-management remote monitoring um, approaches. I think what's interesting about that is uh, it, it gives the patient immediate uh, data and information about their own condition. Um, and I know they're, they're then sort of using that data to communicate with their health um, professional or health provider um, if, if required. Uh, but, 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 you know, again, we've seen quite a shift in that in, in recent years in terms of, of how we're integrating that approach um, with in primary and, and secondary care services. Thank you, Margaret. I don't know if Donna is, is able to... Yes, um, you know, I mean, just, just to add what Margaret was saying, um, and I've stuck it into the chat, but I think actually just to you, which is not helpful. Um, this is one of the key um, areas of activity that our Scottish um, digital health and care innovation center is looking at right now, which is um, looking at that uh, taking data that, you know, from from the actual citizen, so citizen citizen generated data, and looking at how we can incorporate that data data um, into. So that would be taking it from smart devices, smartphones, wearable technologies, but integrating it with um, formal health and care data, which gives you a much clearer picture of the citizen and indeed their not only their 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 health and well-being but clearly also their motivation to um actually be much more um um uh, in terms of their self-management be much more capable of, of self-managing directing their care um so that's a big area um that we're looking at right now uh, in scotland and taking forward but very very much one of of um that's in development i think it's fair to say can i just chip in as well there tina it's nessa um i was just going to say the other the other factor to consider and certainly in scotland a, a, a challenge for us is around um socioeconomic access deprivation and access to digital tools um, so there's two things I think that are also relevant is one is how many smart devices are available and how they interact with the health the health and care system in quotes um, and how you manage that process and the other side is accessibility um, where quite often at least for us in Scotland um, the higher prevalence of long-term conditions and, and certain other illnesses and conditions is experienced much more heavily by those who are in socioeconomically deprived areas. So you've got access, um, you've got contact, you've got um, health literacy, you've got a number of issues there, I think, that are at play. Um, it's, it sounds wonderful, but I don't think it's that straightforward, personally. Uh, that's my own view. That's not the Scottish government's view. That's my view. Um, I think it can be quite challenging. Where we have seen success, as Donna said, Margaret mentioned the remote health monitoring, especially around long-term conditions management, is in really simple, easy to use text messaging or simple devices that are not very expensive, not data heavy, um, and can be accessed by the majority of people. And the final thing to flag up, I think somebody mentioned it in the chat, perhaps Donna, 
Um, you know, that's one of the reasons behind the Connecting Scotland initiative, um, which is to roll out um, free devices with training, a six month kind of backup support plan and training. And the ambition is to deliver that to 50,000 citizens. That's very new, just in the last few months, one of the outcomes from the COVID response about exactly this point, digital inclusion and how we expect people and want people to use digital platforms, but do they have access to them to be able to do that? Um, so that's my tuppence worth. Thank you, Nesame. I was also seeing the comment from Donna on uh, information governance that is uh, emerging here and probably differs from uh, the previous situation when we are now uh, connecting with third-party data. I want to move to the next uh, two questions uh, to close this and then we will open the floor for uh, more questions. Uh, we have seen different governance features that help at least in Scotland mm -hmm. and Israel, probably in uh, many other countries uh, to ensure progress uh, for, integrated, uh, for integrating care but within the professional uh, domain and now we are facing uh, third-party party, uh, health data either from patients from medical devices apps or in in, in a uh, wider scenario from other sectors uh, the question is uh, does these features are valid today uh, for these new challenges or they have to uh, be completely uh, revisit and reformulated And I, I would like to uh, have um, Ruth uh, commenting on the results. We have like a big majority on that they are still valid, but need uh, major adaptation. And, and here the adjective is important compared with minor adaptation. So we have to revisit this uh, governance. Is this your uh, view, Ruth? Yes, I think, um, thanks, Tino. I think that um, one of the things about technology is the connections and the shared data. And I think that as Rachel presented, it is very important that different organizations can and are able to share data and share this data with the governess, especially when uh, we're talking about uh, like the, like in Israel where the system was built not by the government, by, but by the HMOs, and then everyone needs to gather together and sort of make the data be available for one, one another. And when we're talking about third party and especially patients now that we want data from them, we need to somehow able, be able this data to present to our physicians, to our nurses, and it it requires a lot of change in the way we designed a few years ago our HMRs and, and our systems. Um, so I think we can use the ideas of sharing data, but we need to change a lot. So this is quite of what everyone here is saying. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Final question, and then we'll open the floor for uh, all other questions. This is open question. What is need to make digital health investments sustainable in the post-COVID era. And I would like to ask uh, the question in particular to Rachel, because we were discussing about this in the preparation. Now we have some results, integration, positive patient experience, connect to current service in new business models, flexibility, PPPs, efficiency, imagination and incentives, very high need, crucial health system could otherwise collapse. Rachel, what's your view on 
on continuing this journey uh, towards uh, health data ecosystem open for innovation and um, ready for this possibility. So it's, it's I think what's to make it, the, the the need to what we need to make investments sustainable is that we need to be able to make every um, euro that we invest count for more. And I think that one of the things that we learned from COVID that will play a part in the post COVID era is the whole change really in the way of doing things using telehealth, which enable we, where we are enabling patients to do more by themselves before they get to the provider and are enabling the system to function much more efficiently than it does today. So that you, it's, I, think, I think one of the things that we're going to be able to need to do is to somehow risk stratify. But I mean, not the way we talk about it in a very intellectual sense or system-wide sense, but risk stratify at the very, um, at the very uh, local level or the very personal level where patients all co also can risk stratify themselves in determining how urgent the care that they need to get and then they can get it very easily and also to enable clinicians to do that really smoothly and easily because ultimately the technology is getting cheaper so it's not an issue of technology it's an issue of processes and it's also an issue of staff availability and so therefore what we need to do is we need to change our system so that we make take advantage of all of the stuff that we've developed for example during covid that we we wouldn't have developed in in four years um and to and to to build that embed that into our systems as a new way of doing things thank you um, tino this is a root can i yeah. add oh, something yeah. to your question um i think that i i think nesta said that a lot of uh, a lot of the projects that they embedded were projects that started as uh, EU projects. And I think we can relate to the COVID-19 things that popped up through, through this period as projects. And we need, in order for it to be sustained, we need to learn from periods, period, uh, from projects that we did in the past. So I think two things that we learned in Israel from projects, from EU projects, and how to make them sustainable and keep on going after the project end are two very important things. And one is um, connecting them to the, to the systems that we have, because if you make a standalone system, it would just stay standing alone in the side after you finish the project. And I think it is very important to not leave out all the things that we started doing in COVID-19, which are now just on mobile phones or things and are not connected to the big systems of the hospital, to, to keep them being connected. And the other thing that I think is very important is the assessment and evaluation. I think management is very pushing to see um, that it is effective and beneficial. And sometimes we maybe need to ask different questions and look at what it is doing for the patients, what it is doing for, um, for, the, for the staff and not just effective and beneficial. And maybe we'll get some other results and make it more sustainable. The one, the one thing I think I agree with, I think she's very right about her principles. I think the one thing I would add for that is that we need to take our, we have to broaden our perspective. And I think Scotland is a good example of this by joining together health and social care, but we need to go beyond that. We need to look at how this impacts the, the total way in which we live. And it's not only social care and health care, but it's also how we work and where we work and how, and, and how we do all of the other aspects of our life so that we need to sustainability is not only measured by how much money it saves the healthcare system or the social care system sustainability is how it makes society more sustainable Can I, um, I also oh, sorry right, let, um, i just i just wanted to to comment on kind of on the on the day-to-day -day basis the consultation um 
level. Um, I think the sustainability also has a lot to do with communication between patients and, and providers. Um, just aside from even introducing new systems and what can be done in the meantime is that um, healthcare providers can uh, uh, can have conversations with the patients about, okay, what, what data uh, should you be collecting? How should you be collecting it? Because I think especially in, in what we've experienced as a challenge, even for evaluation is, you know, different people are using these technologies so uniquely that it's hard to produce those uh, results of evaluation like efficacy. Um, so in the meantime, uh, uh, a, a lot of what we found patients and providers saying is that, you know, we, we need to uh, communicate what the assumptions are when, when patients are using these devices, communicate that they're using the devices, and then what information is key for both the patients and providers to talk about uh, and the data to talk about during the con consultations um, in order to make any kind of sustainable change practical as well. Thank you, Megan. That's, That's my two cents. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just a quick point. I was thinking about the sustainability um, word, and um, I, I probably mentioned this on a webinar this morning with Root. <laughs> I think you were there. <laughs> so apologies, Root, you're hearing it again. Um, that was with New Zealand, so it's a different audience at least. I think convenience, I don't know if I made this exact point, but the, the evaluation, the, the survey, the public feedback that they've been doing over the summer, on video consultation, specifically video consultation in Scotland, um, has been really interesting in some of the feedback. And two things I can't get out of my head because they stick there so well. Um, one was um, a barrier to video consultation, especially during the period of COVID, and we are still in a challenging period in Scotland. And that was privacy, privacy for video consultation in the home, finding privacy, finding a private space. And that was considered to be a barrier. But the other one, which um, our health professionals are not thinking about, frankly, and which is absolutely a key issue to the wider societal issue now, um, was people who are working in the flexible zero hours, gig economy, trying, trying, trying to make a bit of a living. Um, and it was so convenient. And we use convenience as a dirty word often in health and care. And I think we kind of need to get over ourselves a bit on that one. And making services convenient to the staff and to the service user or patient is really important and it's going to be important. And people who can't and don't access services, again, I'm coming back to that point, um, are often the ones who don't have a private space to talk or cannot get to a GP or a healthcare provider because of their caring responsibilities. So I think we really need to focus on what those people need to shift the dial a bit. Thank you, Nessa. Diane, maybe in the chat box there are uh, other questions, or if someone else wants to take the floor, uh, feel, feel free. Um, th th there are almost too many questions to uh, to deal with, but there, there is an area that, apart from data ecosystems uh, and process relationships that we've talked about, there were a couple of people, and here I'm thinking particularly of Luke and of Niels, who were interested in digging deeper around whether you have done very much, either of you, around artificial intelligence, how much that is supporting your data collection, your data gathering um, on a technical side and also the extent to which anything medical, clinical it is involved around prescription. I'm just simply echoing the question uh, that, uh, that Nils and I think also Madalena were, were asking about uh, how is in this, environment, in this innovation environment, how are you addressing uh, artificial intelligence uh, and, and how, how in relation with the ecosystem as such? Well, I think that everybody is, first of all, I mean, everybody's, everybody is working on um, artificial intelligence and um, as this is one of the big areas where there's a partnership between the healthcare providers, both the HMOs and the hospitals and industry. Um, so that, the, uh, you know, we're, we're basically what we're moving from is what we used to call clinical decision support systems, which were based on rule engines into artificial intelligence. And everybody's going, everybody's going down that road. 
Um, and we're and there are actually even now from the Israel Innovation Authority, there are grants now being made available to uh, kind of push that forward. But that means then, if I can, and I don't want to 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 go too much on over time, but do I understand, Rahel, that uh, while you mentioned that competition was an important driver for the members of the ecosystem of Maccabi to uh, innovate and, and, and develop digital health, here the, the ecosystem uh, is, is not uh, considering this question on competition since we have all these HMO, uh, HMO work working together uh, uh, on the topic. Or are they, are they no, no, they're not working together on the topic. They're each working individually okay. and competing with each other on who's going to be first and who's going to build the best artificial intelligence. And that's, but, but, but ultimately, we, they, the, the results get shared. But still, um, mm. the, ho they're ho the hospitals are competing about who's the first. Shiba Medical Center has been making a lot of publicity about the artificial intelligence that it has built during COVID. Um, so that they, the, at, the, at the local level, there's still a lot of competition also in artificial intelligence. Thank you, Rahel. Tino, I think uh, time to close. Yeah, yeah the time to close. Uh, there are uh, uh, clear final key messages uh, and the current context requires uh, revisit uh, governance. We have seen difference between bottom-up and top-down approach, but more commonalities, collaboration uh, between top and bottom players and uh, the, this idea of uh, marrying uh, uh, stakeholders instead of engaging them. And finally, you know, knowledge and information sharing as uh, something as important as data sharing. Uh, I want just to finish uh, announcing that uh, uh, in the next uh, weeks, we will organize the Tele Innovation Initiative, Exploring Digital Therapeutics, and the webinar will be on interaction with human beings and uh, also very proud to announce that the, the 2 and 3 of December, we will uh, run the 2020 Thought Leader Ethel Symposium. And, and the lemma, uh, the slogan for the symposium is digital service in the move towards healthy and resilient communities. We really count with all of you to participate on this event that uh, will be open and virtual. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, the participation today. We close the session here, but we can keep uh, having an after workshop uh, discussion for those that uh, can stay with us. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Diane, all the presenters, Rahel, Nessa, and, and the front row for your uh, quality interventions. Thank you very much. <laughs>